Chapter 11, Applications B Marketing. This chapter is one half international marketing, global marketing, and one half a culmination of the past 10 chapters. So in this chapter, what we're setting out to achieve is to get you to start applying ideas that you've encountered in the previous chapters into a more practical and pragmatic framework. They say a good theory is only as useful as its application, and this is all about creating means and mechanisms to think through decisions. So you come across a whole series of lists. You come across categories, website types. What you're doing with these is that you're looking at archetypes. I won't say cliches, but you're looking at tropes. You're looking at commonly applied ways to describe the world and the ways to think through. And they are starting points. So what you're looking at here is the sort of processes that you want to be using these frameworks for is your segmentation. You want to be thinking, I've got a way of describing a set of websites. What sort of audience do I want? What sort of audience do I have? What sort of website would they want? Positioning, if you're going to be doing it around benefits and features. The product features, this is to look at these types, what type of website or phone application or social media presence am I creating? Where does it fit? What are the, what are, are the features that you would expect as default for the similar types of sites? Does my relative advantage actually exist? Promotion. This is also about working out of the types of sites, of the types of content that's out there on the internet, what is the type of communication message that they use? And what's the type of communications that you would see there and see present in those platforms? So if you wanted to sponsor content inside a paid or a, a freemium premium application on a smartphone, you'd want to get those phones you want to get those applications and applications of a similar nature to them and look at the type of message that they are currently carrying, the type of advertising that's currently in those platforms. So you're using this to go and assess what sort of message suits the audience that I'm trying to address. You're also looking at this in terms of the types of content are ways, again, to classify parts of your product. This framework was written around the notion of Web 1.0, uh, lesser extent Web 2.0, but you can see this in terms of, I need to create content for my social media. I'm going to write things for Twitter. I'm going to record things for YouTube. I'm going to take photos of things and send messages for Instagram. I'm going to post status updates. And what type of content do I need? And this is where we start looking at things like, are you going to be using advocacy content? Are you going to be doing content that is just about reinforcing the brand? Big visual, visual images. Are you going to use your Instagram to every 10th post have a very visual, visceral reminder of the brand and who the brand is? Are you going to call out an opponent, go head to head with them, do a head... Do a chart, a comparison, us versus them. There are a surprisingly large number of comparative information blog posts hosted by companies saying, my brand versus my competitor. Are you going to do self-promotion? What aspects do you need to cover in terms of legalese, copyright? All of these are different types of content that you can create. What elements are going to engage direct interaction? And what direct interactions are you going to undertake? What sort of navigation mapping? Is it going to be a complex site that needs a map? Is it going to be a site that actually has a map that you can physically look over? Or is it going to be somewhere where if you want to find it, there's a little search button, good luck. And what sort of influencing are you going to try and do with your content? And this can be basically both 
overtly political and passively political in terms of advocating, say, for open source software or open government, open data, versus advocating for a closed proprietary system. You also have aspects where you're looking at from um, is, your com is your communication around a cause, a message, is it public service? What aspects of if you're trying to sell something or recruit, where are the calls to action? What content is about calls to action? And lastly, in terms of content, this again, we're thinking here originally for websites, but what's your crossover? What component parts here are about history, diarizing, developer diary for software, behind the scenes for movies, exclusive sneak peeks, day in the life of, all these ways of humanizing your operation are also content you can create and implement. So, the other aspect of this chapter is we talk about the general application of the internet. And this is about getting you to think, now I've studied a whole lot of e-marketing components and elements, how do I cash it in? And really, customers care about people, information, communication, entertainment. And entertainment is somewhere between those three hybrids. Learn something, enjoy, escapism. It's very similar to TV without the people side. Customers really don't care about marketplaces. Customers aren't thinking about it as market space. Customers aren't thinking about, well, I can engage this brand and look, I've got awareness. Now I've got a real chance to befriend cat food on Facebook. It doesn't work like that. It's one of the embarrassing things about e-marketing, having been in the game 20 years. We thought people would get so excited by tinned cat food, they would follow tinned cat food on Facebook and interact with tinned cat food brands on Twitter. Once, of course, those brands started posting photos of cat video, photos of cute kittens and running cat videos and send us a copy of your cat doing something cute, we'll send you some friskies. Hell yes, people were interacting because there was value. All the way through, what people care about is value. They can't always articulate what's valuable about liking toothpaste. And yeah, some people have friended a toothpaste. Uh, some people have got their toothbrush friended on Facebook. For e-marketers, it's people. People, 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 people. That is the value. We get access to audiences. It's also one of the costs, people. But for us, markets are a key. We think in terms of top-down. We've got the internet. We can slice it up into smaller parts and sell them things. Whereas the internet, generally, the people on the internet are going, I'm here to do stuff, achieve things. And they're not consciously going, hello, I've walked into the marketplace. So think, it's all about the people. What can we do to create value for them? And perspective is a critical aspect here, is it's very easy for us to go, wow, I look at the size of this market, look at the opportunity here. And that's to us really important. But when we are that customer who is that market, we don't care. We're not excited by the fact that you are now here to take our money from us, unless what you're offering is valuable. So, on the business side, there's a whole lot of applications. Again, for the most part, you'll find this idea of the digital native, born digital, born, that you're supposed to come at this with an inherent, innate, this is why it works for business. Reality is, you are not, in, no one's innately born knowing why businesses would value something. You learn that. What you want to be thinking when you work for a firm or work for yourself is, what's valuable in terms of what we can do with the internet and e-marketing rather than what is the inherent merit of a global distributed network of people at keyboards and people on phones. So briefly, touching on international and export marketing, 
always raises the question, is all internet marketing a form of international marketing? The answer is no. No, no, no. You can do local marketing, not global, don't care about the rest of the world, just purely local, really close quarters, only care about people within 5,000 meters of the entrance of your door. You can use the internet for that. So the considerations are, the internet is not a level playing field. The internet is an open field, but if you walk onto that field ill-equipped, poorly resourced, and with limited budgets, and you come up against a very well-resourced, rich opponent, you're going to have trouble. So it's not a level playing field, it's an open field. And even then, some of the openness is getting closed off. Physical products are stuck with the physical condition. You can't get them from point A to point B without respecting the laws of physics, distribution channels, so logistics still count. In fact, it's gotten worse for logistics now. The number of times that you'll find a product where you've got a nice cartload of goods that you want to buy from America and the shipping is more than your entire cart combined. And at the point in time that you are queuing up about $150 worth of product to find out that your shipping is $200, you're looking at this going, that's $350 in US, no. The price is still an issue. The barrier, getting things from point A to point B, is still an issue. So you're quite often better off just being a niche who operates in a feasible distribution network who uses the internet rather than going, I'm on the internet, therefore I am global. A huge number of Kickstarter operations have fallen foul to the, we can sell to anyone anywhere in the world. How the heck do we get this product from Kentucky to the Antarctic base? How much it costs, how much to ship this packet of cards? Again, attractiveness of international markets over the internet basically is entirely the attractiveness of the international market. That they've got the internet is nice. It means that they probably have reliable power. But having lived in Queensland in summer, we don't necessarily have reliable power and still the internet at the same time. You don't make a decision of, I'm gonna go into an international market because they've got the internet. You use all the rest of the international marketing decision-making processes, which bluntly come down to, have I sold to this market before? New product existing, sorry, new market existing market. Have I sold this product before? New product existing product. And who am I selling it to? It's all about e-segmentation. The uh, questions though, in terms of domestic, international, by default, international by design and regional. Domestic is a valid decision. It is an absolutely valid use of the internet. You set up your local shop, you operate the shop, you take online bookings, you do online sales, you sell, but the only shipping you offer is through Australia Post, local courier, and that's it. You are domestic and that's your market. And if you serve that market well, it is more valuable than being an international exporter who performs poorly versus a domestic retailer who performs well. The international by default, this is uh, one where you're not intending to sell to the rest of the world, but if someone's willing to pay the shipping, you're willing to put it in the post pack. This is reverse of that is the international by design where you've come out to say, I am global from the get go. I am going to target a global audience, therefore I will facilitate the international exchange. I will work out my pricing in multiple currencies. I will start with an eye to, if I'm selling a physical good, how do I get this product into the, into the hands of the audience I want? 
quite often international by design is around software or services and international by default is around physical objects. Lastly, regional franchising. And this is where you customize to a local domain so that you have the big international brand, but you have local shop fronts and you use the subdomains. You use com for the international, com au, com whatever the other extensions are, co NZ, Co UK, you use all these different frameworks and you regionalize so that someone logging in from Australia gets the Australian site in Australian dollars, um, which never says anything like G'day mate on there. Whereas you have the international sites, you also find sites that use geo tracking. Uh, don't do this, this really sucks. Geo tracking, where you go to a site because you want to go to the American site because that's the link you're following and it goes oh I see you're from Australia let us redirect you to content that isn't on this site it's not on the Australian site it's on the American site but you've been auto routed down to the Australian site and you don't get to see the content you want that's failure that's across the board failure because not only did I not access the product you've helpfully blocked me from accessing your product the pragmatism of international e-marketing, basically, are you going to do this? If you are, do it well. If you're not planning on doing this, the sporadic is the opportunist. Regular e-marketing is a lot of work. Take the um, international marketing subjects here. Learn your requirements and get a lawyer. Uh, the other aspects to getting into the audiences Again, it's all e-marketing meets international marketing. But the ultimate question is, what's the most effective way of getting the customer I want to get the product I'm offering? And this can be using brokerages. I have a product that I sell through a US broker. And I sell this through a US broker because my audience is likely to be in America. And I don't want to have to ship things to them at ludicrous rates when a print-on-demand service in the United States, will the total transaction cost will be less and they'll take a larger profit margin from having a broker at a print on demand for look after my product creation versus me buying up in bulk and physically shipping. So you've got to really do your numbers. And the last aspect that I really want to talk to you about the pragmatisms of e-marketing is almost a cautionary tale here about how e-marketing lowers some of the barriers, but particularly the psychological barrier of export and the psychological barrier of import. That Google and searching the internet and traversing the internet Buying from somewhere that you wouldn't fly to to go to, so you wouldn't fly to LA to go to this store, but you can buy from their site, drops a bunch of the barriers and drops the sort of barriers of, oh, look, it's excessive costs, excessive risk. So there are ways and means that can lower these barriers. But also it runs into these, uh, one of the aspects that you need to be really mindful of is the product market barrier of legal in point of origin, not legal in point of destination. And of the stupid things to run into is the Nerf blaster, toy gun, toy blaster, by a major international franchise, the Hasbro Corporation, can't sell American blasters in Australia because the American blasters are overpowered compared to the Australian safety regulations. So we can't have them sold directly. We can't buy them directly from the manufacturer. But if you go to the right bit of Amazon, you can have them shipped to you. So because you're buying it as personal, it doesn't, the rules don't apparently work that way. 
So product market barriers are very strange things. They're things you need to be mindful of. It comes across, and I know some of the strangest things are, there are caffeine products you can't import into Australia because we have strict laws governing the concentration of caffeine. We have questions around certain safety standards. There are radio frequency issues if you're getting into high technology. There was a period that you couldn't import certain handheld devices like the Palm Pilot because, and it's showing how old I am, but basically it's the equivalent of an iPhone 6 not being allowed into Australia because despite it being a universally accepted platform, there was a possibility it could be used in a manner that might interfere with emergency service broadcasts, therefore the product was legal. It was one of these most peculiar things, which there's now with uh, free trade agreements and various trade practices agreements, the product market barriers are sort of neutralizing, but there are also things of cultural issues. What is a culturally acceptable product in one area, and what is a culturally, what will have cultural barriers? What will have barriers in terms of the export restrictions? from customs, from what's legal in the country, what's morally acceptable in the country, uh, movie, literature, art, video games, all these things have these barriers. So you really got to watch those because it's really a lot easier to ship globally, sporadic exporting, but you still have the question of are you liable for the product that you have created that's 100% legal in your home ground that you on sold to somewhere where it was not legal in the slightest. Uh, the final things that we're going to really be getting you to do inside the chapter, look at, combine, there's a lot of tables around this area, match what you can do with the internet as a business against what you can do with the internet as a customer. And this can be your entrepreneurship brainstorming session. You want to create something for a market look at the component parts, look at these areas, how do we build this up, what are people looking for? This chapter was designed to have a set of brainstorming, uh, there's a mega table in there of combining attractor types and content types and product elements and points in the innovation adoption curve, give it a look as a means to brainstorm how do I create a product. And that's it for the chapter. It is one that is very much about you applying your knowledge and using your knowledge. You've had a bunch of information up to this point. Now it's time to go play with it. Build it, rebuild it, run multiple iterations. See what you can do about getting the idea to work, but also about trying out these ways of thinking about the world as starting points.